Christians in divorce statistics. Now, this is not something that you'd, we deal with a lot. Most of what we deal with is um, uh, the creation-evolution controversy. But it is, after all, faith in science. And when somebody claims that science is against faith, it's probably worth um, um, asking about and looking at carefully um, whether it is uh, creationism or not. Um, I'll begin by observing that traditional Christian attitudes on divorce were shaped by the Bible. If you go to the Torah in Deuteronomy 24, uh, it talks about divorce laws. And this is a law that's specifically referred to by Jesus. Um, this is the one that says that uh, if you're going to divorce, you have to make it official. You can't just leave the lady in limbo. She gets it in writing. And uh, that was a step up from previous attitudes where, you know, a guy could just basically do whatever he wanted to and the woman was kind of left hanging, not knowing what was... Uh, or perhaps knowing what was going on but not being able to prove it. In Malachi 2.16, um, it says, uh, God, I, uh, I hate divorce. And uh, so you get the idea that at least it's not a good thing. Certainly the... Um, uh, the consequences for women in those days were pretty uh, uh, negative, and uh, consequences for men in those days were probably negative too, but they just, uh, some of them didn't really care, didn't really notice. Then you come to the New Testament where uh, in Mark 10 and Matthew 19 repeats that. And also in Matthew 5, the Sermon on the Mount, which is echoed in Luke 16, 18, it talks about, um, but I say to you, anybody who puts uh, his wife away uh, causes her to commit adultery. It's phrased in slightly different ways in the various texts. Some of them will say, except for adultery, that's in Matthew. Some of them will say, period. And um, the best manuscripts leave that uh, difference unresolved. But at least it's very clear that this is not something that you do because we just don't love each other anymore. And then in 1 Corinthians 7, there's advice of the believer's attitude towards an unbelieving spouse. And then Paul seems to counsel that if the unbeliever wants a divorce, and you, you know, don't fight it. Um, on the other hand, if the unbeliever is content to stay, um, let him stay. Um, so, from that, it appears that if you have two believing spouses, there should never be divorce. Um, well, it depends on what you want to do with adultery, I suppose. Uh, are you truly a believing spouse if you commit adultery? Um, but you could, I think, fairly say that the, the Catholic ideal is just no divorce, period. Now, they make an acceptment, exception for annulments, which if annulments were always early on before you had kids, I could understand, but sometimes it'll be after, uh, you know, 20 years and five kids. Uh, you'd think by that time uh, one would leave it alone anyway. But in any case, the Protestant attitude does allow for divorce, but basically says that somebody has to have done something wrong. And intuitively that makes sense from a Christian perspective that says that your attitude should be love to everybody, including your spouse. Two people that love each other shouldn't 
have to divorce. It's pretty much that simple. Now, in Jewish culture, it isn't quite as strong as either the Protestant or the Catholic uh, uh, prohibitions, but it is definitely felt to be undesirable. The Malachi 2 text uh, kicks in there. And so, uh, regardless of which of those uh, uh, branches of faith you belong to, you pretty much get into um, no-fault divorce is not appropriate. Um, the secular attitude on divorce, which has become prominent relatively early, or probably in my time, actually, uh, 60s, was that God didn't give marriage. It's really a human convention, so you make up your rules as you go along. And, uh, you know, you might try cohabiting first to see if you fit before you just uh, uh, tie a permanent knot. And then if you fit, you tie the knot. And if you're not fit, well, you move on to somebody else that is a little more fit. Um, if you want to get married, then that's okay. And it really doesn't matter who you get married to. Uh, if you want a divorce, you know, divorce is like a belt. If it fits, you buckle it. If it doesn't fit, you unbuckle it and try another belt. Um, and the concept of no fault divorce came out of that, you know, why does it have to be that, that this is a permanent bond? And the two sides basically talk past each other. I mean, if you have to answer a couple of questions, does God exist? Did he perform the first marriage, which is true for all the Judeo-Christian heritage? Then, uh, Marriage is a pretty serious thing, and you don't, you don't uh, dissolve it without some really good cause, and probably without somebody um, having to be at fault, at least one, maybe two. Um, then, of course, you get into, okay, so you have these two kind of poles. Um, what should the state's attitude be? Does the state get run by the Judeo-Christians? Does it get run by the... Uh, secularist, um, what happens if there's a large number of Judeo Christians that start feeling like the secularists have a point here? And uh, then the question comes you know, supposing one is deciding as to whether it's a good idea to think about divorce or perhaps uh, to do it, who do you trust? Which of these camps do you trust? when deciding what to do with your own life, your own marriage. And the problem is you have to make those decisions before all the facts are in. As I said about emergency medicine, but it's true about all of life, emergency medicine is the art of making decisions and acting on them based on incomplete and inaccurate information. and knowing that the information is inaccurate and incomplete. And um, so the question is, now where do you go from there? Um, and of course, well, can science help us? And the claim that science can help us puts this squarely into the, the court of faith and science. So let's take a look at what's been claimed and then uh, ask our own questions and say, um, you know, what, what more do we need and, uh, um, and where should we come down in the meantime? Well, if you look at some places, and I'm just going to pick some representative samples, they're not necessarily complete. In fact, I know they're not complete. Um, but if you go to Huffington Post and conservative Christians and divorce, there is a uh, headline that came up um, in, two years ago that said, conservative Christians divorce more than other groups. And uh, the text goes, the daily text in divorce is more common among conservative Christians and young people according to a recent study. And read the whole story, the daily text. Unfortunately, if you click that, um, uh, you'll find that the daily Texans article has disappeared. 
I have no idea what it says. Well, maybe we can find something else. The new civil rights movement. Christian polling group finds atheists divorce less than Christians. An evangelical Christian pollster finds that atheists commit less crime, divorce less, and are better educated than their fellow Christians. It is obvious that you do not have to believe in a higher power in order to live a moral and successful life. Quite the opposite. The Knoxville News Alvester file writes of the study. One of the things I found odd is why not cite the study itself? But it's not there. Why are we quoting uh, Al Westerfield? Well, maybe we'll look at Al Westerfield in a little while. Adding that the groups with the highest crime rate, the poorest marriages, and lowest education continually strive to force their beliefs on the non-religious, and the politicians pander to them. Why else would they pass laws to put religion in the schools and on courthouse facades? And then they wonder why the godless could possibly be upset. Hmm, maybe we can find a little more here. According to a Barna Research Group report, fundamentalist Christians have the highest divorce rates, followed by Jews and Baptists, Westerfield writes. We're still quoting Westerfield, not the Barna Research Group, whoever they are. The godless are tied with Catholics and Lutherans for the lowest divorce rate. It seems that some of the groups claim to follow the Bible most strictly are not putting their money where their mouths are. The godless who are thought to be without morals seem to take their vows more seriously. Hmm. According to a Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life survey, the least educated Americans are Jehovah's Witnesses followed by black Protestants. Well, I'd like to know where the Pew research... No link. Followed by black Protestants and fundamentalist Christians. The most highly educated are Reformed Jews, followed by Unitarian Universalists and the godless. Some groups like to, seem to like their flocks ignorant so the pastor's interpretation of God's edict are not questioned. Other groups prize scholarship and achieve more in their lives here on earth. In fact, a review of worldwide studies found that criminality and religion go hand in hand. The countries with the most religious people have the highest crime rates, set highest sexually transmitted diseases, and the highest teen pregnancy rates. This is also true in the United States. The more religious a state's population, the higher the crime, STD, and pre teen pregnancy rates. The report does say that the religious are happier than the secular, but posits that ostracism of the latter may be a major cause. Um, all of these other things, you just accept the statistics the way they are. Uh, when you find out that actually religious people are happier, now you find an excuse to, to ignore the data. Um, something strikes me as this is cherry picking, but how do you prove it when there's no place to go to find out where they got their statistics? Is it that said there are liars, blank liars and statisticians? Is that who it was? Uh, it's, you know, <laughs> if, you, um, if you cherry pick your statistics enough, you can prove almost anything. I'd really like to know how they did this. Well, let's go to our friend Westerfield. The godless commit miss less crime, have longer marriages, and are more highly educated than almost any other group in America. Well, almost. According to the Federal Bureau of Prisons data, the number of responding people in, pr in prison acknowledging they were Catholic was 39%, Protestant 35%, Muslim 7%, Jewish 2%, and Godless 0.2%. 20% did not respond. Since the number of Godless is estimated to be 10% of the general population, all things being equal, you expect the prison population to be 10%. If as many people assume the Godless do not lead moral lives, you'd expect the number to be greater than 10%. The fact that the actual number is 50 times less than expected can lead to only one of two conclusions. Either the godless commit less crime than the religious or they're too smart to get caught very often. Well, I can think of another suggestion. Maybe the 20% that don't want to say are actually atheists and so they're overrepresented in prisons. But uh, uh, that just declined to say, that just, <laughs> I, 
I don't see how you get there. But uh, again, according to a Barna Research Group report, fundamentalist Christians have the highest divorce rate followed by Jews and Baptists. The godless are tied with Catholics and Lutherans for the lowest divorce rate. Hmm. Aren't some Lutherans fundamentalists? It seems that some groups are, that claim to follow the Bible most strictly are not putting their money where their mouths are. The godless were thought to be without morals seem to take their vows more seriously. This, of course, has been quoted by the other one. And here's the Pew Forum on Religion and Public Life Survey. Again, no link. Uh, no even reference. How would you trace that down? Well, actually, we did. I, I did a lot of that um, hunting down the Barna Research Group, and we're going to look at that in a minute. And um, yeah, that's interesting. Um, Well, that, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, I was born in a Catholic home. You know, I've strayed a lot, but I'm really basically Catholic at heart. And I'm in prison. <sighs> My mom wishes I went to church more often, but it uh, does sound like uh, maybe there's a little, um, there's some differences that might be teased out of that, that data. But you see, if you need it as a bludgeon to knock somebody over with, uh, you don't want to ask those kinds of questions because they might actually uh, give explanations that you weren't very happy with. Um, so what conclusion can be reached? And see, this is the conclusion he wants, of course. It is obvious that you do not have to believe in a higher power in order to live a moral and successful life. Quite the opposite. Now, he says, I won't attempt to claim a correlation of religion with crime, infidelity, and ignorance. However, it is total hypocrisy for those in such groups to claim that the godless are not and cannot be moral. Um, there was to note that I have some overlap. Yet in a recent study, atheists were believed to be no more trustworthy than rapists. And then the, this is the paragraph that they quoted at the end, or actually at the beginning of the other article. So let's go to the Barna group. It took me a little while to find it, but it can be found. And so I put in a search thing on divorce. Well, you find that divorce pops up in all kinds of articles. How the last day, decade changed American lives, marital as also nearly a quarter of Americans who have ever divorced. Well, that's not what we're looking for. Christian women, part three or four women, give themselves an emotional, spiritual checkup. Um, Eleven women point to divorce or bad marriage as the biggest disappointment in their life. That's not what we're looking for. Of um, divorce and widow's adherence? No, no. Ah, new marriage and divorce statistics released. Let's put that one in and come back to it. New statistics on um, church attendance and avoidance. Atheists and agnostics take aim at Christians. And if you look at that one, it says something about divorced from something else, which is obviously not using it in the literal sense. Um, and then we'll scroll down a little further. Well, I'm not going to go through the whole, thing, the whole list, but uh, I'm just going to point out the ones that are interesting. Born again Christians just as likely to divorce as are non Christians. That's getting closer to what we're looking for. Actually, as it turns out, the article that everybody got excited about was published in 1999. And it is no longer available from the Barna Group. I don't know. Do they not stand behind it? Or are they just trying to save web space? You'd think you'd keep one of those kind of classic articles up. But they haven't. So let's go to the last one that we had, which is the oldest one. Born again Christians are just as likely to divorce as, non, as are non Christians. 
So, a little introduction. The study uh, uh, shows that the likelihood of married adults getting divorced is identical among born-again Christians and those who are not born again. Okay. Based on interviews with a nationally representative sample of 3,614 adults. This is a pretty extensive study. Hopefully it isn't biased. I'm sure they did the standard things to try to keep it from being biased. Focused on three-quarters of adults 18 years of age or older who have been married at least once. The study identified those who have been divorced, the age at which they are divorced, how many divorces they had experienced, the age at which the born-again Christians had accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. So let's... Um, um, among all adults 18 and older, three out of four, 73% have been married, half have been are currently married. Doesn't count 3% separated. Those who have been married, one out of three had been divorced. One out of every five adults had ever been divorced had been divorced multiple times. So that represents 7% of people who have had multiple marriages, not just two, but three or more. Well, at least two, two and two divorces. The average age at which people first dissolve their initial marriage tends to be in the early 30s. Um, one third of the married adults from the previous generation had experienced a divorce. Half of all married boomers had experienced it. That's a pretty impressive jump. So, you know, if you lived in the older generation before the baby boomers, before the 60s, then um, you stood a pretty good chance. If you're um, after the 60s, then you're in trouble. 50-50, close to 50-50% chance of divorcing. Um, and one quarter of the baby busters have already divorced, and that's just that they haven't even had time to live for the older ones to get their divorces. Christians have the same incidence of divorce. Married and born-again Christians, 35, have experienced a divorce. That figure is identical to the outcome of marriage at adults who are not born again. So at least whatever his born again is doesn't seem to protect against divorce. And of course, that's something that's going to be trumpeted as, we'll see, your religion doesn't really do you any good. Um, Now, George Barna does note that one reason why the divorce statistic among non-born-again adults is not higher is that a larger por proportion of that group cohabits effectively sidestepping marriage and divorce altogether. You don't have to write things up when you split up, you just split up. Among born-again adults, 80% have been married compared to just 69% among the non-born-again segment. So there's a little twisting of statistics here. Although you could argue that, uh, you know, if you're not make, planning to make it permanent, why not just... Um, um, but it does suggest that testing the marriage ahead of time doesn't really help. Um, it's likely that their divorce statistics would be roughly 38%, marginally higher than that among the born-again group, but still surprisingly similar in mag magnitude. So... If you looked at, if you looked at things again... Look at what? Uh, that one you just sort of passed through. This one here? No, up. Up. Among born-again adults, 80% have been married, compared to just 69% among the non-born-again segment. If the non-born-again population were to marry at the same rate as the born-again group, in other words, if they married instead of cohabited, it is likely that the divorce statistic would be roughly 38%, marginally higher than that among the born-again group. So apparently, Testing ahead of time, all, all it accomplishes is that you have a failed non-marriage. Doesn't seem to help you 
Um, but it doesn't seem to hurt, at least according to this. Now, multiple divorces are also unexpectedly common again, born again among born-again Christians. Barnes figures show that nearly one quarter of the married born-agains get divorced two or more times. The survey also showed that divorce varied somewhat by a person's denominational affiliation. Catholics were substantially less likely than Protestants to get divorced. There is a favored group, 25% versus 39. Among the largest Protestant groups, the ones most likely to get divorced were Pentecostals, apparently not much control there, uh, whereas the Presbyterians, quite a bit of control there, had the fewest divorces, 28%, which notice that it's, that's starting to get into Catholic territory. Is divorce a sin? And this is what people believed it. But you know, notice that there's um, only one out of seven, ad every seven adults, or 15%, strongly agreed with the statement when a couple gets divorced without one of them having committed adultery, they're committing a sin. Wow. I guess there are some people that don't uh, take the biblical admonitions very seriously. A similar percentage, 16%, moderately agreed with the statement. So 15 plus 16, you're looking at 31%. Well, if you don't believe it's a sin, no wonder it's, uh, society doesn't have uh, much co control or you don't have much control over uh, uh, what you do with divorce. Um, that might have something to do with Catholics, except that majority of both Protestants and Catholics disagreed that divorce without adultery involved the commission of sin. Um, this is ambiguous here. A majority of both Protestants and Catholics disagreed that divorce. I think that means that they don't think it constitutes a sin. At least that's how I read it. Boy, that's high for Catholics. You would think that most Catholics um, followed the official church teaching in this, but I guess not. Um, there was no difference in, point of, uh, in this point of view across generational groups. The, Apparently, blacks think that um, you're more likely to sin if you get, if you uh, divorce than whites. Okay. Now, again, if you don't believe that divorce is really that bad, then what's the big deal? Um, now, this is kind of interesting. You want to know, what, what are they talking about by born again? And we're going to go with, with that. And these are just some statistics. And they did telephone interviews. And they made multiple calls. And they're telling you the, the way they collected the data. And they weighted it slightly because of national demographic proportions. So. Um, Born-again Christians were defined in these surveys as people who said they had made a personal commitment to Jesus Christ that is still important in their life today, and who also indicated they believed that when they die, they will go to heaven because they had confessed their sins and accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's a born-again Christian. It says nothing about church attendance, says nothing about um, any other belief system, um, I think that they're using that definition because Barna's group happens to buy the idea that once saved, always saved, and all you have to do is make a commitment to Jesus Christ, and so you're saved. And so that's what a born-again Christian is, is somebody who uh, has accepted Jesus. And uh, that is still important in their life today. You have to throw that in, because otherwise Michael Shermer, the president of what is it, Skeptics Society, um, 
would be classified as a born-again Christian because he had an experience where he gave his heart to Jesus and of course he doesn't, uh, he's not sure that Jesus even existed or certainly wasn't the Son of God now and so it is not important in his life today otherwise. You'd have atheists as um, born-again Christians. Um, respondents were not asked to describe themselves as born again. So they asked the, the question, you know, did you commit to Jesus? Is he still important in your life? You answer yes to those two questions, and then you, do you think you're going to heaven because of you've committed your life to Jesus? Now, for what it's worth, don't copy this without permission unless you're doing it for academic reasons and are not taking money. Okay. <clears throat> What about that other article? Most Americans get married at some point in their life. Just one out of five has never been married. Among those who've said their wedding vows, one out of three is divorced. And this is a new study. Uh, a higher proportion of born-again Christians and the atheists and agnostics don't tend to get married as much, which is not terribly surprising. Um, Now, they, they have a bunch of things that they're pointing out. Uh, the groups who have the most pro prolific experience of marriage ending in divorce are downscale adults. That's people who don't have much money and much education. Baby boomers, those aligned with the non-Christian faith, African Americans, and people who consider themselves to be liberal on social and political matters. Hmm. Among the population segments that the lowest likely to have been divorced subsequent to marriage are Catholics, Evangelicals 26 percent. Hmm. That's interesting. Upscale adults 22 percent. Apparently um, having enough money is helpful. Asians 20 percent. And those who deem themselves to be conservative on social and political matters. Well, this begins to sound more like the kind of data that I was kind of expecting. Born-again Christians who are not evangelical were indistinguishable from the national average in the matter of divorce. So evangelical makes a huge difference. The survey did not determine if the divorce, we're going to have to find out what they consider evangelical. The survey did not determine whether the divorce occurred before or after the person had been, been born again. However, previous research by Barnett has shown that less than two out of every ten people accept Christ as their Savior do so after their first marriage. So, probably not that many. Um, now, when evangelicals and non-evangelical born-again Christians are combined into an aggregate class of born-again adults, uh, their divorce figure is statistically identical to that of non-born 32 versus 33 percent. So apparently born-again Christian doesn't help, but evangelical does. Now, that's not something you would have caught from these other people, is it? Born-again Christians who are not evangelical were indistinguishable from the national average in matter of divorce. The survey did not determine whether the, well, we t uh, I should have had an arrow on that one. In fact, evangelicals, let's see, 30% 30, 30 of atheists and agnostics have been married and sub subsequently divorced. However, the three-point difference in the national average was within the range of sampling error, suggesting that their likelihood of experience a dissolved marriage is the same as that of a population at large. Representative Barna also pointed out that atheists and agnostics have lower rate of marriage and higher rate of cohabitation, a combination of behaviors that distort comparisons with other segments. And that's certainly true. Um, so here's the statistics in tabular form, and um, if you look here, evangelical Christians are way down. Not as much as I would like to see, but it's still, that's a significant number. Uh, Non-evangelical born-again Christians doesn't seem to matter. Uh, associated with non-Christian faith actually is a, uh, a detriment. Atheist or agnostic is 30%, which is uh, 
um, lower, but again, that's a distorted statistic. All born-again Christians, all non-born-again Christians, so atheists and agnostics are pretty close, but the one group in Protestants anyway seems to be evangelicals. That's probably because they believe the Bible's actually true. Protestants in general are 34% versus Catholics at 28. You'll notice that evangelical Christians slightly beat out Catholics. I'm not sure I'd make too much on that, but we're going to see some even more interesting statistics in a little while. Um, obviously, upscale versus downscale makes a huge difference, and they'll define upscale and downscale in a little bit. Um, white, African American, Hispanic, Asian apparently has a protective effect. Um, white and Hispanic are virtually identical. Conservative versus liberal. Apparently liberal is a huge risk. Conservative is a huge, has a huge protective effect. Well, at least noticeable. And uh, now they're reflecting. This is obviously coming from the Bar uh, Barna Group. This is from their website for what it's worth. Um, I showed you the reference earlier. And he's commenting that there's no longer a stigma attached to divorce. And um, he's written a bunch of books that, uh, and in fact, if you want to get a book by somebody else, there's a little ad for it right in the middle of this. The research is based upon telephone interviews conducted by the Barna Group. And back a random sample of 5,017 adults, ages 18 and older, and the maximum margin of sampling error because of that is uh, 1.6 percentage points if you use 99 percent, pardon me, 95 percent confidence limits. Um, so th basically they're pegged within 2 percent. Now, the uh, minimal statistical weighing was used to calibrate the aggregate sample to known populations percentage in regard to several key demographic variables. Uh, Born-again Christians, again, are defined that way. Evangelicals meet the born-again criteria plus several other conditions. So all your evangelicals are born again. Uh, the, there's include saying their faith is very important to their life today, believing they have a personal responsibility to share their religious beliefs about Christ with non-Christians, believing that Satan exists, Believing that eternal salvation is possible through grace, not works. Believing that Jesus Christ led a sinless life on earth. Asserting that the Bible is accurate in all that it teaches. That's a, actually a pretty good way of saying it. And um, describing God as the all-knowing, all-powerful, perfect deity who created the universe and still rules it today. So if you believe all those things, you are an evangelical. Being classified as an evangelical is not dependent on church attendance or the denomination or affiliation of the church attended. So you could be an evangelical if you believe all that stuff and you were a um, United Methodist, for example. But you believe all that stuff, you're still considered an evangelical. And uh, downscale, now here's the, some definitions of that. Downscale individuals are those whose annual house come, household income is less than 20,000 and who have not attended college. Upscale people are those whose annual income is $75,000 or more and have graduated from a college. So upscale includes education as well as uh, money. And... Uh, they talk about the Barna Group and what research it does, and they have that, again, that disclaimer. Well, apparently there has been some more recent news. Christians question divorce rates of faithful. It has been proclaimed from pulpits and blogs for years. Christians divorce as much as everyone else in America. But some scholars and family ask activists are questioning the oft-used statistics, saying Christians who attend church regularly are more likely to remain wed. It's a useful myth, said Bradley Wright, 
a University of Connecticut sociologist who recently wrote Christians are hate-filled hypocrites and other lies you've been told. Because if a pastor wants to preach about how Christians should take their marriages more seriously, he or she can trot out this statistic to get them to listen to him or her. In other words, you can make Christians feel guilty because they divorce at the same rate as everybody else, whereas it might not actually be true. The various findings on religion and divorce hinge on what kinds of Christians are being discussed. Well, why am I not surprised? Wright combed through the general social survey of vast demographic study conducted by the National Opinion Research Center at the University of Chicago and found that Christians, like adherents of other religions, have a divorce rate of about 42%. The rate among religiously unaffiliated Americans is 50%. There's still a difference, but it's close. When Wright examined the statistics on evangelicals, he found worship attendance has a big influence on the numbers. Six in ten evangelicals who never attended had been divorced or separated, compared with just 38% of weekly attendees. So we went from 50% to the non-religious to 42% in general to 38% if you attend church every day or every week. Right questions the approach of the Barna Group, evangelical pollsters based in Ventura, California. Barna's latest published divorce statistics say one-third of all adults, including non-evangelical born-again Christians, have ended in marriage. Barna's statistics are tied to highly specific and controversial definitions of born-again Christians and evangelicals. Particularly, born, uh, Barna labels Christian born-again if they have made a personal commitment to Jesus and believe they will go to heaven because they accepted him as their savior, and of course still have that commitment. Evangelicals, on the other hand, are those who fit the born-again definition but also meet seven other conditions, including sharing their belief with non-Christians and agreeing that the Bible is completely accurate. Uh, well, that's close, in all that it teaches. David Kinneman, Barnum's president, said the statistical differences reflect varied approaches, with Wright looking more at attendance and his research firm dwelling on theological commitments. So, uh, what you do with it actually matters. We've tried to measure it based on theological perspectives, not merely their church attendance or whether they call themselves Catholic or mainline, Kinneman said. Glenn Stanton, a focus on the family, and we're going to look at his thing, wrote a recent column in Baptist Press highlighting Wright's interpretation of the state of divorce for Christians. The divorce rate of Christian believers are not identical to the general population, not even close, he said. Being a committed, faithful believer makes a measurable me difference in marriage. Brad Wilcox, director of the National Marriage Project at the University of Virginia, agrees that there's been some confusion. You do hear, both in the Christian and non-Christian circles, that Christians are no different from anyone else when it comes to divorce. And that is not true if you're, if you're focusing on Christians who are regular church attendees. Wilcox's analysis of the National Sa Survey of Families and Households has found that Americans who attend religious service several times a month we're about 35% less likely to divorce than those with no religious affiliation. Nominally conservative Protestants, on the other hand, were 20% more likely to divorce than originally religiously unaffiliated. There's something about being a nominal Christian that is linked to a lot of negative outcomes when it comes to family life. Hmm. Let's go and look at that um, uh, article. And. Uh, for those of you who are looking at where we're going, where this is our last uh, set of actual data to look at. I'll make a few comments and then open it up. Christians divorce at roughly the same rate as the world. It's one of the most quoted stats by Christian leaders today and it's perhaps one of the most inaccurate. At bottom, it is used to explain that Christians are not doing well in living out their faith, but it could also be taken as a statement that redemption by and real discipleship under Jesus makes no real difference when it comes to marriage. But mainstream sociologists would, uh, would tell us that taking one's faith very seriously, in word and deed, does indeed make a marked positive difference in the health and longevity of marriage. Based on the best data available, the divorce rate among Christians is significantly lower than the general population. Here's the truth. People who divorce seriously, or pardon me, people who seriously practice a traditional religious faith, whether Christian or other, have a divorce rate markedly lower than the general population. The factor making the most difference is religious commitment and practice. 
What appears intuitive is true. Couples who regularly practice any combination of serious religious behaviors and attitudes, attend church nearly every week, read their Bibles and spiritual materials regularly, pray privately and together, generally take their faith seriously, living not as perfect disciples but serious disciples, enjoy significantly lower divorce rates than mere church members, the general public, and unbelievers. Professor Bradley Wright, sociologist at the University of Connecticut, explains from his analysis of people who identify as Christians but rarely attend church that 60% of them have been divorced. Of those who attend church regularly, 38% have been divorced. Other data from additional sociologists of family and religion suggest a substantial marital stability divide between those who take their faith seriously and those who do not. And uh, what I'm going to show you next is the um, is the data itself. The following chart shows the relative risk of divorce by religious affiliations among Catholic, Protestant, Catholic, and Jewish adherents. And he's controlled for other socioeconomic factors, including marital health, or th that impact marital health. That's providing a clearer, cleaner measure of the actual religious dynamic on marriage. And. Um, so what they're saying here, now this is 0% would be the national average. 20% would be 20% more than the national average. Minus 97% means 97% yet l less than the national average. And it's particularly interesting, there's actually one group that fulfills that. Protestants, nominal, 20% over the average. Conservative. 10% under the average. Active conservative, 35% under the national average. That's quite a bit. Catholic, minus 18. But if you're nominal Catholic, you're basically at the, close to the same divorce rate as everybody else. If you're an active Catholic, you drop down to 31. Not quite as big a split as the Protestants, but it's definitely there. And the Jewish, are just phenomenal. Regular Jewish divorce at 39% above the national rate. That's probably because most Jews are nominal Jews. And they divorce at 53% above the national rate. Active Jews, minus 97%. Try telling me that belief and acting on that belief doesn't matter. That is an astounding statistic. Professor Stanley from the University of Denver, working with the absolute all-star team of leading sociologists in the Oklahoma marriage study, explains that couples with a vibrant religious faith had higher and more levels of the qualities couples needed to avoid divorce. Uh, whether young or old, male or female, low income or not, those who said that they were more religious reported higher average levels of commitment to their parties, higher levels of marital satisfaction, less thinking and talking about divorce, and more lower levels of negative interaction. These patterns held true whether, when controlling for such important variables as income, education, and age at first marriage. Christianity, when taken seriously, actually has an impact on divorce-related behaviors so it's no real surprise that it has an impact on divorce. Those who say they're more religious are less likely, not more likely, to have already experienced divorce. Likewise, those who report more frequent attendance at religious services were significantly less likely to have been divorced. Now, the takeaway, I'll just move that to the next one. These data indicate that the divorce rate among serious believers is not something to crow about. It is still higher than most of us are comfortable with, but there is no reliable mainstream social science data that has this rate higher than the general population. Faith and discipleship do make a difference in our lives. It doesn't make all of our problems go away. Now, this article, in contrast to the others that you've seen, has references, and you can look them up. Um, it may be difficult because these are book, this is a book and uh, this is a, an anthology, but with the appropriate library, you can at least find it. And this one is actually on the internet, being a government publication, and therefore, um, and if you're curious, there's the 
That's for people who are looking at this on the internet and they can actually read that now in case. And um, then the final one, there's the web address. So, now my take, personally, I think that the the idea that a personal belief in the permanence of marriage in a community that fosters marriage and discourages divorce, that the idea that that should have no influence on behavior just strikes me as very unlikely a priori. To say that human behavior is completely oblivious to that idea. In order to be true, that idea would have to attribute all, all behavior either to genes, and I'm not willing to do that, or to random decision making. And I don't think that's true either. Um, I think that decision making is based on what people believe. The only arguments that could sustain such a position rationally would be either demonstration that genes controlled everything else, which I think is, has not been demonstrated by a long shot. I think there's some good evidence to the contrary, in fact. Or that experimentally, it was true. And of course, that's what people try to do with the Barna study. Statistics, I think, can be misunderstood or twisted by those who are too willing to accept incorrect but convenient <coughs> explanations. And I think that's what's happened here with the people who wanted to say that Christians are just like everybody else. The more detailed evaluations suggest that early reports of Christians being o more likely to divorce may have been overstated. I <laughs> that's putting it kindly. I would like to see more prospective studies, that is to say whether Christians who say they're Christians now, whether it protects them from divorce in the future. And I don't think that study has been done, although I'd like to look at some of the other ones. And s I did look at the Oklahoma study, and I do know that it doesn't collect data in that way. Um, well, at least it didn't report data in that way. Uh, maybe somebody could dig through the materials and, and look at where people were five years ago and now where they are now. Um, I do disagree with those who claim that Christianity cannot have demonstrable secular value. We have, for example, the Adventist Health Study, which suggests that Adventists live longer than the average population. And I think that does have something to do with their health uh, uh, practices. This history and the history of the study of the effects of divorce on children which is one that showed that divorce, in fact, did have a lot of effects on children in spite of the fact that uh, sociologists really didn't like those implications. It suggests that if there's not enough data to be sure, accepting the arguments of religious skeptics, who I might note have a dog in this fight, um, as a guide to life may lead to permanent damage and therefore may not be advisable. And uh, with that, I will open the floor. What? I have no idea what happened there. There we go. But um, comments, questions? Looks like we have one back here. Pass that up. Uh, just a comment. A, a relative who lived in the Loma Linda area for some years as a, as a single lady came to the conclusion that Adventist men who are worth having stay with their wives. So that's one way to summarize it. Uh, that's probably true of the general Christian community too. Uh, at least the, the, the Christian community that believes that the Bible actually is authoritative in this field. Yes? Uh, I'll make a little more lengthy statement. I'd like to preface it by saying that uh, for 35 years, I practiced as a licensed psychologist and a licensed marriage, family, and child counselor. And I've taught marriage and family at the college level. And uh, my wife and I have been married for 55 years. 
so we believe in marriage and uh, don't believe in divorce. But uh, the statistics that you quoted here were somewhat different from the ones that were uh, common during the years that I practiced, which were from the early post-war years, the early 1950s on to the early 1980s. And I was dealing in the early time that I practiced with uh, what uh, Tom Brokaw calls the great generation, people who had grown up through the Depression and participated in World War II. In the latter part of my practice, I was dealing maybe w mainly with baby boomers who had grown up uh, during the period of communes and free love and experimental approaches to family and so on. And don't trust and anybody over 30. And yes, understand uh, the Bible is the over 30. Statistics were different. Uh, when I was practicing, for instance, the peak years for divorce were the fifth and the 25th. The fifth, because by that time, people had a chance to find out if they were incompatible or if they had individual flaws the other couldn't tolerate. And the 25th, because if they'd only been staying together because of the children, the children had entered the workforce or gone off to college, and they had no cement to hold the marriage together after that. Uh, I would remind everyone rele uh, relevant to this discussion of the old saw that says correlation does not prove causation. That is true. Uh, we have uh, hmm? Relations here between various demographic factors, uh, but uh, a high correlation may mean that one event is the cause of the other, or it may mean there are joint effects of a hidden cause that isn't taken into account. And occasionally, uh, to be cautious about this, it may mean that the other is the effect of the one. Or you For example, if you're thinking about divorce, if you're perhaps filing for divorce, maybe you don't want to face all those people at church so you don't go anymore. That's right. But uh, you also can have two totally unrelated events that nevertheless result in the same effect. Uh, and I think we may be dealing with some of that here. Uh, I'd like to mention just a moment some of the kind of things that to account in the statistics and surveys you're uh, quoting here that could have a very important effect on divorce, and they mainly have to do with family structure. Uh, questions like, were the parents divorced, or did they stay together while you were growing up? Uh, questions like, were you an only spoiled child, or did you have siblings that you had to adjust to? Questions like your order of birth. Were you first and more or less parented your younger brothers and sisters, or were you a last child that was parented by your older siblings, or you were somewhere in the middle? Order of birth seems to have an important effect. Uh, all of these things have to be taken into account and could be even more important than the factors that you're mentioning up here in predicting who will get divorced and who does not. Uh, mentioning uh, factors that weren't weren't brought up were um, size of family. So, like the post-war years before birth control pills, and they had large families, and then large families would cement the uh, relationship. And now we have birth control pills. You may not have children for a lot of years, or just have one or two. It's a little bit easier to split up, and maybe a factor of why the Catholics are a bit higher. And they didn't look at Mormons, but maybe the same factor would affect them too. If you have a whole bunch of kids, you, you stay together for the kids. It's harder to separate. And, and then, of course, that, that leads into your 25 years of marriage and all the kids are grown up, and uh, now we can finally get rid of each other. I, I think the amount of church attendance among divorced people is also affected by, oftentimes, people who are divorced feel ostracized and feel they're not included in the social activities of the church, or they find that when they're divorced, even if it's not their own fault, that um, they may lose some of their friends. Well, if, you, if you're a divorced woman and, uh, uh, you know, people might be hesitant, particularly the women might be hesitant to invite you over, who knows what you're going to do with their husband. I'm not saying that you would, it's just, it's just the kind of thing that's in the back of somebody's mind and, and, and would... Uh, or maybe divorce is catching. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think there are a lot of factors to consider in, in this regard. Uh, the other thing is that it is possible that one of the effects that happens when you start not being sure whether the Bible means what it says is that you all of a sudden ex started questioning it in this area too and, and uh, something that would have held you together beforehand is, is simply gone in, anymore. Uh, experientially, that's what apparently happened to my parents' divorce. Um, this is not totally an academic issue for me. Uh, I think that the important thing to realize is that the claim that it really doesn't matter what you believe doesn't have the scientific support that was claimed for it. Uh, and I think that that's, you know, when people are using those statistics as a hammer for uh, to try to beat Christians into the ground to either make them convert or at least shut up. It's probably not true. And I, I think that this is one of those areas where it's fair to give a little pushback. Now what I'd really like to know is how did the Jews do that 97%? Um, because, you know, if we could bottle that and sell it, <laughs> somebody would make a fortune. Um, and I, I have run across a couple of areas where Christians have claimed similar uh, statistics. I'd really like to know, you know, whether those statistics actually hold. Uh, because if they do, uh, there may be something positive to be said about that end. I see this as not just simply a matter of defending Christianity against libel, but also a possibility of actually teasing out uh, something of value. I just I haven't seen anybody actually do it, but I've seen some people who quote statistics for evangelicals, which rival those of the uh, certain evangelicals, which rival those of the uh, of the. Con uh, the practicing Jews. There was no hint of um, were these Orthodox Jews or liberal Jews or so on? Well, I am guessing they're probably not Reformed Jews because I don't think the Reformed Jews really care that much, but maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it includes Reformed Jews too. I, you know, when I saw that statistic, I thought, why aren't they emphasizing that more? Because of all the other statistics, that's the one that really jumps out the most. Now maybe it's because these are Christians who are doing it and think that we can't learn anything from Jews, but I happen to be of a different opinion on that. Maybe it's a full Sabbath rather than just uh, a Sunday that you go to church. The, the population there was what, 5,000 was it on that study? Yeah, something like that. Although I'm sure that the Jewish population wasn't 5,000. Yeah, I'm, I'm just raising the question. I wonder how much. How, how big was the Jewish population uh, size there? It doesn't really say, so what I think you'd have to do is you'd have to go back to the original article and tease those numbers out. Uh, fortunately, it's at least theoretically possible to do that, which uh, wasn't true for some of the other people who wrote stuff. Yes? Maybe, <coughs> excuse me. Maybe it's just kind of a side note, but um, I seem to find uh, comments that Mrs. White has made in her writings about a certain perspective on the, the family relationship, the, the husband being the house band of the family, um, you know, tying the family together, taking care of it. And I almost wonder if maybe some of the Jewish correlation comes back to that because a lot of what I read in what Mrs. White says reminds me very much about what I read in the patriarchal period of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and some of the stuff there. So I wonder if some of it has to do with just where they're getting, just where the Jews are getting their ideas on 
marriage because if they're non, because it said the nominal Jews, the ones that aren't as as deep into their faith, have a tendency to be less that way. But the ones that are more tend to be more deep in their faith. I don't know. It's just a a side comment. You are not allowed to think that way. That is totally sexist. <laughs> and and uh, just just to make a side note, it is a lady that's bringing it up, and a lady who does have a house band in her family, and she loves it very much. So <laughs> maybe I, maybe I, I'm being completely politically incorrect, but I have a tendency to think that some of it may come back to some of the ideas that people are promulgating or propagating in the world. My other comment was, have they ever done a study where they um, because they're trying to say that uh, cohabiting is better than marriage. Have they ever done a study where they actually include into the, the statistics? Because according to marriage, marriage is living together with a person. Have they ever included in a study all of the times that you've cohabited with someone, and then when you get married, if it really was any better? Well, there are studies that suggest that marriage after cohabitation is less likely to be permanent than marriage uh, without cohabitation first. My uh, reason for stating that is because some of those, those figures may be off because of the fact that, at least in, 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 from the religious perspective in God's eyes, when you're living together, it's this almost basically the same thing as marriage unless it's completely um, but whether the state, an annulment circumstance, yeah. but <laughs> whether the state has a piece of paper or not is not as important in God's eyes as whether you're actually right. uh, joined as one flesh. So that's where I come to the point where I, I think that your atheist numbers would be a lot higher because according to a religious perspective, if you're living together, you're married. <laughs> so yeah. even if you don't have a piece of paper, if you live together and you stop living together. But, I mean, that's just a, a comment from my own self. I, I would have to agree. And uh, uh, I, I think that's something that, uh, you know, if we start seeing that uh, supposedly closed-minded patriar patriarchal societies tend to, pro tend to give us both longer-lasting marriages and happier marriages, then we've got to take a long, hard look at the dogmas that uh, that uh, are being propagated as as absolute truth. And just for a comment, I don't mind the closed-minded patriarchal period simply because when you have a man who loves God so much that he follows God, he will take uh, the, the the admonition in the Scripture where he will love his wife as Christ loved the church. When you have someone who loves his wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for the church, you have a husband who is going to do everything he can to make his wife happy. And that may be what the patriarchal period had, is this I the same idea that from both sides, it's looking at the other's happiness first, not your own. I don't know. Maybe it comes down to selfishness, too. I, th I think there's a good argument to be made for that. Yes. Just a side comment first. Uh, I wonder how many of us here would respond if the, um, and what way would respond if George Barner's group called us saying, we'd like to talk with you about divorce or whatever. How many of us would say, sorry, I don't have the time, you know, or not even answer. So I'm not even sure how, how true, how authentic this whole thing is all about. You know, that's one. Uh, just why I think Mark Clemens was right. Well, you know, the, the, the one on prisons. Yeah. I'm not telling you what religion I am. Why not? <laughs> uh, <laughs> what kind of religion do those people have, actually? Probably. Ooh. <laughs> yes. Just a, a, uh, what I really wanted to say. A little different twist on what we're discussing. Uh, the medical community is very unforgiving to folk who do drugs. One cannot wear a white coat and talking with a lady whose dad is dying of a heart attack, saying, hey, I did uh, crack cocaine last night, but I'll talk to your dad. Uh, that's not acceptable. Um, how about among us Adventists, someone who has divorced his wife and is 
living with another woman, goes up in church in front and preaches from the book. I'm sorry, in my, in my, with me, it's over. He has forfeited his right to be a pastor or even to be leading out in the church. But it's happening even in Seventh-day Adventist church. Well, on my exit, I'll say this. When they're asking Jesus whose wa uh, wife she would be in heaven, we all know that scripture. She had the sixth, uh, the sixth man, uh, had, brother had died. And uh, Jesus said, well, if you knew your scripture, etc., cetera, and, it was, and he equated it to the resurrection, he says that, that in heaven uh, there is no marriage nor given in marriage. So that's something else we guess we could talk about, we're writing about. <laughs> uh, that's an interesting point. Uh, I think one that, uh, one that we need to be a little bit careful about how we treat people who uh, have not lived up to the ideal here. Mm -hmm. And I'll put it that frankly, I, I think that the ideal is one man, one, one woman. I think that's very interesting with the cap you put on that. Yeah. Mm. But that's an interesting scripture. Yeah. One other thought about hidden causes that weren't taken into account in the study. Uh, there was scarcely any notice of one of the major causes of divorce, which is incompatibility. And there are many kinds of incompatibility, interracial marriages, interfaith marriages. Uh, a male comes from a patriarchal family where the father rules. A female comes from a divorced mother marriage who's a feminist. and works in the workforce and stays at all these kinds of incapacities can be a major cause that the uh, statistics don't take into account there. I think though that in, at least as far as the ideal is concerned, uh, I think that there is a very important point and that is that if love is the ideal, I don't see divorce happening. Uh, I see, I see love, not, not sexual attraction, um, although that's nice to have, but, but I'm thinking specifically of the kind of self-sacrifice that was talked about where the husband so sacrifices himself for his wife, the wife self sacrifices herself for her husband. They live in a mutually uh, where they're living for each other instead of for themselves. I don't see that interracial makes any difference. I don't see that uh, even interfaith, I think, can be, can be worked around, and it has been. It uh, can be, but it is. It's, it's harder. <laughs> I would agree with you, it's harder. But, but I think that once you've, you've gotten in a committed relationship, I mean, the Apostle Paul says, hey, if they're going to stay, let them stay. Uh, which suggests to me that while the uh, one partner doesn't have all of the control, one partner has a great deal of influence that can, can be used. And I have run into a number of people who, where the, the wife got uh, found in religion some kind of a wonderful <coughs> thing, and the husband starts thinking, well, this is all crazy, but you know, she's really different. Um, and the the husband uh, in, in this particular case, I'm thinking of Lee Strobel in particular, but I'm, there's a number of other ones that have done the same thing, where he says, you know, she's got something I want. And what happens is that with time, they move to unity in the faith. Yes. That's what I was going to say. You mentioned uh, that uh, one will sacrifice for the other. Uh, the main point there, and I think that this has not been in any relationship, the first the thing I said to Lee, Dr. Lee, in 1957, when he, we, he asked me, he wanted to marry me, thought about that, and one day, just out of the blue, it seemed, I said, the most important thing, everyone forgets friendship. They need to... Uh, examine that particular word again. Even Jesus says, I call you no longer, you're, you're friends now. I give you to know the mysteries of the universe. So friendship, if you understand what friendship, integrity, 
loyalty, all of those adjectives, but friendship through it all. This may sound very uh, prayeral, very simple, but it's simply profound. Through the friendship, through it all, as the song goes, it will not only sustain, but it will live, and will live in that love that passes all understanding, which has joy, pain, forgiveness, and uh, all that good stuff. Have a blessed Sabbath. Okay. I want to get to church. <laughs> okay. I mean, the, the other, other church, this is, this is great church, believe me. Thank you. Well, I'll see you all next week. Um, and uh, I'll be announcing the uh, precise content of what's uh, going on uh, in time for you to react to it.